Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful introduction, and thank you for coming tonight to the Mesa Lab for this talk, the last talk in the Explorer series. Thank you to all those of you who might be following us via live stream uh, for tuning in tonight. This is a talk about the phenomena here, atmospheric phenomena that affects us all on the front range through shaping our natural environment and in turn shaping our lives. And whether you like the downslope winds or not, whether you are a fearless flyer or a skittish one, <laughs> I hope you will enjoy uh, this evening with me tonight. Mountain clouds, mountain wave clouds, are among the most beautiful clouds that form in the Earth's atmosphere. How many of you have seen clouds like these? I thought so, quite a few. Uh, <laughs> was it here on the Front Range or somewhere else? Only here on the Front Range? OK. Well, they do form uh, worldwide. And, and this cloud, which is called technically a lenticular cloud, or in the Latin name, Alto Cumulus Lenticularis, has actually formed in the lee of Mauna Kea on, on the big island of Hawaii. Alto indicates the height, cumulus indicates the shape, and lenticularis comes from lentil, as a matter of fact. Uh, the Latin uh, describing the lens shape, which exactly the, this cloud has. And if you look more carefully at this cloud, it actually has several layers to it. A layers, five layers, little stack caps on top of each, each other. That indicates the layering of moisture, moisture in the atmosphere. These clouds are actually related to mountain waves. They are generated by mountain waves, and thus they are also called wave, wave clouds. They can be quite spectacular. They can be spectacular in both shape and in color, um, especially at sunrise and, and sunset. And they are quite mysterious. They have an aura of mystery to them because the shape can be quite intricate, even more intricate than this one. And they also persist in, in, in a given location for hours. So sometimes they are mistaken for UFOs. And trust me, they have nothing to do with that. Uh, but they equally have inspired scientists and artists alike, and they continue to do so. And whenever I look at a lenticular cloud, such as this one in particular, Einstein's statement comes to mind. And he said, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger, who can no longer pause to wonder and stand wrapped in awe, is as good as dead. His eyes are closed. So I invite you to keep your eyes open and uh, join me on this journey through mountain waves, winds, and clouds. So how do they look here on the Front Range? How do these clouds look? Here is a very nice, clean example. And a photo taken by my colleague, um, senior scientist Bill Randall um, from, from NCAR. This is a north-northwest view from the NCAR Mesa lab. And um, as I'm looking at these clouds as a scientist, I'm immediately analyzing. What do I see? I see clouds at many different levels. I see that I can draw a phase line, a line connecting the same positions of the, on, on the wave shape. Think of a simple sinusoidal shape. And the phase line is the line that is connecting the same point of the updraft on, on, along the phase of, along the wave front. What I know as a scientist is that that phase line is actually perpendicular to the flow. And so I can draw the wind direction. There is a wind direction approaching the mountains, and this gives me information. I didn't quite do the analysis of this photo, photogrammetric analysis to tell you what exactly the direction, but I know from the climatology it is westerly winds and, and sometimes slightly north of westerly that give rise to the winds, winds here on the front range. The waves that gave rise to these beautiful clouds are not generated by the front range, um, by, by the uh, flat irons. They are generated by the mountains further to the west, and oftentimes they're generated by, by the continental divide themselves. 
itself, which, which is oriented in the north-south direction here. Um, so it is actually, we get a very clean, clean, nice looking waves when the westerly flow, when it's westerly flow approaching the Colorado Rockies. So what else do we see? I mentioned several layers of clouds. In the middle column, if you look at the middle column, there are three layers of clouds. And altocumulus, our friend altocumulus lenticularis is here. There is a lower layer, and there is also an upper layer. And the lower one is called the stratocumulus uh, lenticularis, and the upper one is cirrocumulus for all you affectionados, cloud affectionados in the audience. OK. The flow through these clouds is smooth, extremely smooth. Anyone who has flown through them, been uh, close to them, knows that it, they, they are smooth. Any glider pilots here in the audience? OK, very good. So the glider pilots will recognize uh, this diagram, which comes from the OSTEVE publication. Uh, OSTEVE is an international scientific and technical soaring organization. And the glider pilots uh, have to know about the waves, and, and they know about the waves. They get quite educated about them through, from the publications, but also from just flying through them. Before I describe how and why the mountain waves form, let me spend some time describing on this diagram itself. On the left side, um, the two yellow lines, curves, describe the profiles of the temperature and moisture in the atmosphere represented here as a dew point. The vertical coordinate is the altitude expressed either as pressure um, or as the altitude in thousands of feet uh, or kilometers. The wind barbs, uh, which is a standard meteorological symbol for the wind, shows the direction, points to the direction from which the wind is coming from. And the little flags on barbs indicate the strength of that wind. Uh, the full one is t uh, 10 knots, um, the short one is 5 knots, and the flag is 50. So this wind is increasing from 25 knots at 850 hectopascal to all the way to 75 at 300 hectopascal, which is at some 30,000 feet. Now, why do waves form in the atmosphere? Atmosphere is a fluid, it's a gas, it's a compressible gas, and it is a stable fluid. Stable means that any that the atmosphere, on average, will resist vertical motion. And as the air parcels are pushed up the mountain, the buoyancy force will bring them down. Um, they will find themselves warmer than their, sorry, colder than their environment, and buoyancy will bring them down as they pass over the mountain. But they will not stop at their equilibrium level, level where they come from. They will overshoot and go further down, find themselves warmer than the environment, and be pushed up. So this restoring force for this wave motion is buoyancy, which all of you are familiar with. You know, If you try to push the balloon in the water, the buoyancy will push it up. And similar as the pendulum, which if you take it out of its equilibrium position and let go, will go back to its position, but it will overshoot it because of the inertia. And it will go back and will continue doing back and forth, back and forth, until friction eventually slows down the motion and kills the motion. The same happens with these buoyancy-driven waves in the atmosphere. They will keep going until eventually the energy somehow dissipates. Now, we don't want to fly yet. OK, the, the solid lines, the white solid lines, are what we call streamlines. And if the flow is steady, it doesn't change, these streamlines actually represent the flow lines. So think of them as the, as the flow lines, because these waves can be steady. They can stay the same for quite a long time. The clouds, um, the, the waves themselves, are invisible to a human eye. And we can detect their presence only when there are clouds that form at levels where the atmosphere becomes saturated with respect to water vapor. And any lifting of the air will lead to the formation of clouds. Clouds in this in situation typically form atop the wave crests and evaporate as the flow goes down. And then they might reappear again for the downwind. You see our friends, Alto Cumulus lenticularis. You see the uh, cirrus cloud up here. And there are two more types of clouds that I have not mentioned yet. The one is fern wall cloud, um, and the other one is a rotor cloud. So fern wall cloud has to do with this if the air stream that's coming from the upstream is fairly moist, clouds will form on the upward side of the mountain. 
mountain, they will rain out or snow out, and some of them will actually spill over on the other side and evaporate, because again, atmospheric compressible warms, warms up and the clouds evaporate. The roto cloud marks the top of the zone that's quite turbulent, and it's indicated with these carrots here that is quite turbulent. All you glider pilots know all about it. In between the two, the, the fern cloud and the roto cloud, there's a gap. It's called fern gap, it's called wave opening. Uh, it goes under many different na names, and there's a reason why it's really nice, beautiful, and sunny and warm here um, in these situations here, here in Boulder. Again, I keep mentioning glider pilots for reason, um, because they've uh, learned, they learn early and repeat often that these uh, wave clouds are beautiful, beautiful for soaring, and if they position the aircraft with the nose to the wind and in the right position here on the upright of this wave, that wave will carry them to a very, very high altitude. They actually have to be careful if their craft is unpressurized that they don't exceed um, the altitude um, at which the, there is a reasonable concentration of oxygen, uh, <laughs> because bad things might happen. Huh? Uh, the world records in gliding, uh, for those of you who are not gliders, the world records in both distance um, flying and in altitude have been achieved in these situations that are called trapped lee waves or lee waves, um, where the energy of the waves is confined to lower levels of the atmosphere and all the waves propagate to very large distances downwind. So the, the world distance record from 2006, I believe, is, is slightly over 3,000 kilometers. And the world altitude record was, again, pushed this year, in, in 7 September uh, this year, um, it was pushed uh, to nearly 16 kilometers, which is even outside of this, my, my diagram, uh, uh, by, by a pilot uh, with a pressurized glider, uh, clearly, uh, <laughs> flying down in the lee of the Andes um, in Argentina. Aside from striving to, to push the world records, uh, the glider pilots, and I admire you all, uh, do quite, quite their devilish things, um, such as intentionally flying through the rotor zone um, to measure how bad the turbulence is, how strong the updrafts and downdrafts are, and uh, how, um, um, how, how strong the intensity of that, how uh, strong intensity of that turbulence is. The photo comes from Charlie Martin, who is not only an excellent software engineer and has been a long-term member of my laboratory, but also is an avid glider pilot. And he teamed up with the scientist Rolf Hertenstein, who is my colleague also, and clearly a glider pilot. And they used the two-seater Schwarzer, um, which was actually the in-car glider at one point, no longer in our, in our suite. Um, they instrumented it with, with good instrumentation for measuring air motion and, 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 and some turbulence they tried, and they flew it on purpose um, in, in these situations with nice rotor and wave clouds. So you can, you're looking west, um, there you can see the, the rain, mountain range, you can see the rotor cloud, the wave cloud aloft, and the pilot. The tow plane is in front, and it is, um, pulling the, the glider to position it on the upwind side of the rotor cloud and then let go. Once there, once they go through the da, 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 uh, once they get into this wonderful position um, on the upwind side, now I've, I've changed the rotation, you are looking north-northwest from above the flat irons and um, here is the fern uh, wall cloud, evaporating gap, the rotor cloud, the altic, lenticularis above, and I've indicated a, a part of the flight pattern of what they repeated several times in these situations. So they would come from the west underneath the rotor cloud. They have to fly the visual, so they flew visual underneath in the rotor zone, but underneath the cloud. Then, after the worst, they would come in the gap opening. They would go north and up above the lenticular and then fly in the smooth, 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 smooth air um, all the way to the, uh, to the east end and descend and go south and repeat, 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 probably until their bodies were <laughs> sufficiently beaten. <laughs> 
Uh, and here is a trace of, of that measurement. So if you look, this is a time series. And this is a vertical velocity on the on the I apologize on the uh, y-axis, and I marked plus minus 10 meters per second. So keep your eyes focused on that region. West, what's labeled west are those uh, sections of the flight path where they are flying underneath the rotor cloud. So as you can see, as they are coming from the east, there is a. Um, uh, a larger scale structure, there is a downdraft and then updraft. But within that, there are really, really severe gusts, um, and that is producing the acceleration. The change of vertical velocity with time is leading to, to the acceleration, and that acceleration can exceed several Gs, plus and minus several Gs. So this, this, is, this is quite a bit of beating, uh, both on the glider and the pilots uh, inside. I deeply, deeply admire them. So let's take a deep breath Ooh, after all these, um, after all that turbulence. And I will take you um, back to, to the other continent, to the old continent, um, back in time, a couple of centuries, to explore roots of wave and rotor research. And lo and behold, they actually go back to my old country, um, to, to the Croatian uh, coast, northern coast, where a fellow a scientist called Andrija Mohorovicic, which you might know, actually recognize his name from the Moho layer, the seismologist who discovered this continuity between the earth crust and mantle. He was a physicist by training, trained in Prague with Ernst Mach, and his first job was here in the Naval Academy on the northern Croatian coast. He got a job and he became a professor of meteorology. And he loved clouds. Uh, he, was, he was an avid observer, keen observer, and he seemed to have a special relationship with the clouds. And he said, clouds are strange fellows, and you must catch them when they appear, and not when would you like to. <laughs> but one cloud seemed to persevere, and, and, or stay in place, was quite stationary. What Mohorovicic noticed, as the Bora wind, which is a northeasterly wind that comes over this dynamic Alps range, when it's just breaking out, which is just starting, he noticed that there is a stationary cloud that is parallel to the coastal range. And he concluded with very little data that in order for that cloud to persist in that location, um, there has to be a circulation that would support it, and updraft at the leading edge, downdraft further down, and he connected with dots by having a few surface observations that were in the opposite direction than the wind. And lo and behold, this con his conceptual model was more or less right. So this, the year is 1889. He published it in the leading atmospheric journal of the time. The observations of Flora Mountains continued in, the, in, in that part of the world in the 1930s and 40s. And uh, here is a series of works documenting the perturbations created by the Atlas Mountain in Algeria, uh, Riesengebirge in Germany, uh, Poland, Crossfell Range in Northern Pennines, um, the Eastern Alps, and then Czechoslovakia. And all but two used just surface observations. Those two in red actually used instrumented gliders um, in addition to surface observations. The first aerial study of Lee waves, of these mountain waves that, that, I, uh, that we looked at in the, in the Steve diagram, uh, was done by the gentleman called Joachim Kutner. Um, who was a meteorology student, PhD student at the University of Helsinki. And um, he was from the region of the Riesengebirge, um, and he persuaded his colleagues, glider pilots, um, that they should all team up uh, to do the study of these uh, strange clouds, which are labeled, it's a local name, Matsagotl, um, which is essentially appeared whenever there was a warm wind on the lee side of the mountains. And so they did. They had uh, more than 10 gliders, um, glider pilots who teamed up uh, to, to work with Yak. And uh, the diagram here uh, is from his PhD dissertation from 1930s, late, late 1930s. And the structure that I showed you in that Steve diagram, which has many more details and is quite more sophisticated, that essential structure is here. So, 
they did, um, at that time, actually, they didn't know that the oxygen decreases with height. And, and, um, and so Yak told me um, that he, once he fl was here in this updraft, he kept going and going and going up until he noticed that his fingernails turned blue. <laughs> and he started seeing double suns. And he has sufficient faculty with him still to realize that whatever that is, he needs to get out of that as soon as possible. <laughs> and so he did. Um, and, and he landed somewhere far, far downstream in Poland. But what he, what he achieved is um, he, he had some instruments on board, um, primarily um, barometers. And uh, they, they provided this wonderful, wonderful documentation. VELE stands for wave. Matsagotl is this local cloud. And he wrote, labeled something else. He actually said there is this terrible turbulent region down <laughs> underneath the wave crests, and he called them rotors. So the term rotors goes, uh, goes to him. Now, I'm taking you back to the North American continent. So another flight over the Atlantic. Uh, we can do it quickly here. So here's a digital relief map of the western, western US. There's lots of lots of terrain here, complex terrain here. Uh, this is just to orient you, the four corners is here, um, California, Nevada. And most of the mountain ranges here are oriented north-south, except perhaps for the Sierra Nevada, which has a southwest-northeast orientation. Um, the um, Uinta Mountains stand out in, the, in that group as, as being oriented east-west. But the rest is pretty much north-south, whether they're wide as Rocky Mountains or they're narrow as the Wasatch or, or the Grand Tetons. That depends also on their geological age. So few of the regions here have been studied extensively. The first one is our Colorado Front Range. The second one is the further to the north. Um, it is Medicine Bow Mountains and Laramie Range. So think of them as essentially the northern extension of the Rockies. And the reason why they have been studied a lot, perhaps because there are two research aviation facilities right there on, on the lee slope, or maybe it's the vice versa. The research aviation facilities are here because there is a lots of lots of atmospheric phenomena that the mountains generate. One is our own, here is NCAR and our research aviation facility. The other one is University of Wyoming um, in, up in Laramie. But I want to draw your attention to the third region here, and that is down here in the Sierra, Sierra, Southern Sierra Nevada, and this what looks like a narrow uh, opening um, in between Sierra Nevada and the Inyo, White Inyo Range. It's actually a wide, long valley called Owens Valley, and that's the third region that has been studied extensively, um, where mountain waves and and clouds and all the phenomena I've been talking about have been studied extensively. So here's the Southern Sierra Nevada. I blew it up. And you can now start to uh, make out different features um, here in this valley. The range, Sierra Nevada range itself, um, has a gentle upwind slope and a rather steep downslope, uh, down um, which is 30%. The slope there is 30%, both on the Sierra Nevada side as well as on the White Inyo Mountains. That slope there is also approximately 30 degrees. The valley itself is wide as the valleys go. I keep having discussions with my European colleagues for whom that is sort of, is this a valley? And I said, yes, it is a valley. <laughs> it's just wider than what you are used to. Um, at the bottom of the, uh, uh, the floor of the valley, it is approximately 10 miles, 15 kilometers, and it's double that ridge to ridge. And Mount Whitney, the tallest peak in the lower 48, is, is right there. The valley is revered by glider pilots, but it's also admired by scientists and, and um, who investigated what happens, dynamically happens in, in that valley for, for quite a uh, while in, in several field campaigns. And one of those, the first one of those, was in the 1950s, and it was called the Sierra Wave Project. The glider pilot, the gliders, instrumented gliders, uh, were the primary platform. 
they had some rudimentary surface observations. Uh, and also in the later stage of that project, they had instrumented aircraft, uh, some B-29s and uh, a war surplus that the only instrumentation they really had were radars to look, look at the terrain uh, on, on, underneath the aircraft. So they were not well instrumented. But the glider, uh, gliders were instrumented and the pilots were quite skillful. And among those pilots was the gentleman Joachim Kuttner. So by that time, he, he was here on the uh, on Northern American continent, and he was the program manager at the Air Force Research Laboratory. And not only was he project manager, but he was also a scientist. And he flew as, as a mission pilot in these missions. So what they documented uh, were primarily the waves. They were, they were interested in mountain waves, in the waves that the Sierra, Sierra generates. But since they used gliders, they had to go through the rotor, and they documented that zone, a zone as well. So in the left portion of the diagram, you see what they labeled a lee wave rotor. So when there is a nice lee wave situation, such as I showed you in the diagram, um, the, rotor, the rotor cloud is there. Right there, um, right above the center of the valley, as the photo shows, Sierra Nevada is here to the left. The Inos are to the right. The floor is from left to right. And you see in that diagram down there, the, the, the full lines are against stream lines. And this rotor circulation is indicated as being present. The flow to the right was altogether something else. They labeled it a rotor because it was extremely turbulent, and rotors have that reputation. So uh, let's call it a rotor as well. Uh, but indeed, the flow uh, had a quite a different character. Um, there were no indication of the waves at low levels. And our understanding today is that this is a hydraulic jump. Uh, it's something, a feature called a hydraulic jump that indeed is very turbulent. And we could call it, um, in that respect, it's OK to label it a hydraulic jump rotor. Underneath, probably you've already uh, read this text, um, is an account from the chief pilot, uh, Sierra Wave Project chief pilot. John Robinson in flying through this, through, through this beast. And um, he said that the turbulence in this was far in excess of anything he had ever found in thunderstorms, which he had been deliberately soaring for many years. And accelerations, he, um, they, they had accelerometers on, on board the um, gliders. And so it was plus 5, minus 4 Gs accelerations. So. You either get pushed against the seat, <laughs> or you are pushed in and flying against the, uh, against the uh, no, ceiling of, the, of your cabin. Of course, wear your belts. Buckle up. Buckle up. <laughs> in 2000, um, we came back um, in that same area. And the, um, the experiment was the terrain-induced rotor experiment. And we brought in our mother of the instrumentation. Compared to what the Sierra Wave project had, we, we were well, well equipped to, to unresolve uh, any mysteries, any, any remaining mysteries, if only the atmosphere cooperated fully. Uh, the outline, the diagram in the background, is actually comes from the Sierra Wave report. Uh, and it is a west-east cross-section across the Sierra Nevada, Inyo ranges, and some of the ranges in the Great Basin. Fresno, you can see Fresno indicated here. Those are the slopes I talked about. And um, here are the three aircraft that we used in these missions. The Gulfstream, I'll start from the top. Our NSF NCAR Gulfstream 5, which is our premier platform. And this was this um, maiden voyage, scientific voyage of that aircraft, the first field full, full fledged field campaign that it supported. We kept it out of the turbulence. Um, <laughs> we didn't want that there. <laughs> the turbulence. Uh, the middle one is the one from the UK, uh, BA146, uh, from the Met Office and, and the consortium of the universities. And the aircraft, the lowest aircraft, is the University of Wyoming King Air. The horizontal lines indicate the flight tracks these aircraft flew and the range of these flight tracks. And you can see that the King Air, the parentheses, includes these lines down in the valley. And so what we did with that aircraft, we actually did plunge down into the valley and did the box patterns uh, within the valley. 
The aircraft carried in situ instrumentation, but also carried specialized instrumentation, such as the two higher ones, uh, drop the drop zones, which are the instrumentation packages that carry sensors for pressure, temperature, um, and wind and relative humidity. And perhaps you have seen, seen one here in our part of our exhibit. This is the NCAR technology, um, this, and used widely by many research aviation facilities around the world. And the, lower, the lowest aircraft carried a cloud radar. This is a specialized radar um, that actually seizes not the precipitating part of the cloud, but seizes inside the cloud, and uh, the reflectors is cloud ice and cloud drops. Those, those that are too small yet to fall out, so they, are, they actually form the body of the cloud. That is a Doppler radar, um, which allowed us also to retrieve the velocities inside the cloud. And so, here we are, flying our box pattern in the valley. You are looking north along Owens Valley. Um, date is 25th of March, 2006. And the mission scientist is Wanda Grubišić. She is sitting in a co-pilot seat. She's not a pilot. <laughs> pilot is in, in command. Uh, but in, in that aircraft, it's a relatively small aircraft. And the mission scientist sits in, in the co-pilot seat right next to the pilot. And, and we emerged. We flew part of our box. So here's our part of our pattern. We are flying west. And we emerged underneath the, the rotor cloud. And I see this beautiful gap. And I'm apt in row. row you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all, oh, this is beautiful. Grabbing for my camera and taking the picture of the fern cloud evaporating, of the rotor cloud forming. And then I'm rudely awakened by the autopilot saying, terrain, terrain, pull up. And. Uh, I turn, I look at the mountains, and then I'm mesmerized by the beauty of the eastern Sierra slopes. They're as beautiful as it gets. But I realize that the aircraft is moving at 200, 220 miles per hour, and we are heading straight into the slopes. And I look at my pilot, and he's calm. He's calmly ignoring the terrain, terrain pull up warnings, and heading for the waypoint, uh, for our western waypoint at which he makes a skillful right turn. And now we are flying along the slopes of the Sierra in exceedingly silky smooth air. It's a downdraft, but it's very, very smooth. And then we reach our northern waypoint. He makes another right turn, and off we go, completing our box. Uh, now we are flying toward the Inos and facing another of these moments, terrain, terrain, pull up. And then repeat, repeat. Um, we repeated that at several, several different altitudes. But we were also, we had to fly visual as well. Um, and um, so we could not fly through, through the rotor clouds. We had to fly around them. So this is a photo from another mission. And uh, you see the, uh, the uh, fern cloud. Uh, well, I call it a cloud fall. It looks like it's coming over the mountain. Waterfall, cloud fall. And then there is a rotor cloud here, which you can see down here in this diagram. This is a cross section, valley cross section, and the altitude. And the solid lines are the, think of them as flow lines, the indication following the flow, those streamlines. And uh, there's a gap in here because we had to fly with the aircraft around that. We continued down into the valley. And you can contrast the smoothness of these lines, which show a nice wave pattern with a crest over the valley, another crest over the Inos, and the jumble of these lines down, down in the valley. The color scheme indicates the intensity of the turbulence um, that the aircraft encountered. So the warmer the color it is, the more intense that turbulence was. I mentioned the cloud radar. So what cloud radar allowed us is, is really to don't do those daredevilish things, <laughs> but to actually fly above or below and, and look at the cloud. And what I'm showing here in the inset is, is the backscatter uh, from, the, from the clouds, from the cloud over the Sierra Ridge and the rotor cloud. 
A big unknown before the project was whether we would actually find any ice in that rotor cloud. It was April already, um, but there was some ice in, in that cloud, which actually was beneficial for us to do the full analysis and to, do, to reconstruct the flow field through these clouds. So now I, this is a strip. I enlarged this. And you, what you're looking is a vertical velocity recovered uh, from, from the um, backscatter data from the radar and shows a nice downdraft, updraft, downdraft, and then updraft again, which mimics what I've showed you here from the in-situ data. And we can also um, get the horizontal velocity um, through that wave. And both of these are remarkable in their values. So the vertical velocity is from minus 8 to plus 8 meters per second. You can notice that part is smooth, but the part closer to the terrain and underneath the rotor is, 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 is rather turbulent, small-scale structures. You can also notice that the horizontal velocity changes dram dramatically from somewhere zero is between here green and yellow. Um, two reds and magentas and 25 meters per second, and then there are even patches where the flow is in the opposite direction. The boundary layer turbulence is tremendous, but that turbulence also in the rotor zone is there with small scale structures with little rolls and vortices um, being there. This data was great. This was exhilarating. Uh, this was the first uh, fantastic data. But the nature, there were not enough scatterers to actually connect all the dots. So we went to Wyoming in winter, where it's cold. And there's ice clouds everywhere. <laughs> and this actually allowed us to reconstruct the flow um, over a somewhat smaller mountain, but it's more stable there, and, and, and the wind can be um, cooperating. Um, and, and so here you see a cross section across that Medicine Bow Mountain. You see uh, the aircraft is here. That's a flight track of the aircraft. And the it's radar is looking down and allowing us to reconstruct the flow field. And you can see how the boundary layer is turbulent and the rotor zone even more so. What we did with that data is actually to derive the quantitative measure of turbulence, uh, which is the characteristic of the flow, and that those turbulent processes in the cascade of energy from larger scale to smaller scales. And we got the numbers here. Um, this is so-called eddy dissipation rate, which is a quantitative measure of the intensity of turbulence. And um, um, that turbulence was severe. So now I should say that the, the, uh, the eddy dissipation rate is an objective measure, it's a quantitative measure, and it characterizes the atmospheric flow. How is, it, how is it felt by the aircraft, by the structure of the aircraft and the people on board, depends on the size of the aircraft. So what I labeled as low, medium, and uh, severe um, refers to that size of the aircraft, such as the King Air, which is somewhere small to medium size. In any case, it, you can see that the wave, the turbulence is undetectable, it's smooth, whereas the turbulence zone underneath the rotor, um, underneath the rotor cloud is severe turbulence. So no aircraft, <laughs> no, <laughs> no matter how daredevilish the pilot is, um, should be there. But what about those downslope windstorms? I mentioned downslope windstorm, didn't I? And I even showed you this photo. Now it's flipped. So the Sierra is, is on the right side. This is that hydraulic jump. Um, it flows from right to left. Here's the sweeping flow down the Owens Valley. And these are either dust, uh, some sources of, of dust or aerosol. Or it's, um, and it, it is being carried by the flow at the bottom of the valley. And then suddenly, it gets picked up and goes a slanted vertical and reaches the base of that cloud. That looks awfully similar to a hydraulic jump in a river stream. Now, there's a different fluid. Atmosphere is a compressible fluid. This is incompressible fluid, water. It has a free surface. But there is a remarkable similarity. So there's a construction, uh, um, con construction here on the river. The flow gets accelerated over, it flows over, over some bump here, which was intentionally put in place. And it gets strongly accelerated as it flows over it. And um, then it goes through a hydraulic jump where there is a tremendous energy dissipation and emerges on the other side as a slower, again, subcritical flow. So this is called a uh, um, hydraulic transition for all of you hydraulic engineers here in the audience. 
So what is this? Why is the atmosphere behaving apparently as, as a hydraulic layer? Not all waves that are generated by flow over mountains have the form of those nice uh, trapped Lee waves that I showed you um, in, originally at the beginning of the talk. Sometimes, uh, depending on the upstream wind and more profile stability, the waves actually can take the form where the energy propagates vertically. All the energy, wave energy, is going up. And if the mountain is tall enough or conditions are such uh, to, to support large amplitude waves, these waves can steepen. And you can use the, the image of ocean waves growing and breaking and, and then leading to, to turbulence, their dissipation again. This is what we called wave breaking region. Waves break. And this region is now starting to, to act as a separator the atmospheric flow in underneath it plunges down the mountain, generating very strong winds that cannot actually persist for thousands of kilometers downwind. But rather than flow that's behaving like a hydraulic layer, has to go through an adjustment. And that adjustment is that jump which we label hydraulic jump. And there is something similar to, to a rotor. So here we, we live here on the, on the lee side of the uh, Rocky Mountains. And this does happen uh, with, with the good, good frequency here on the Front Range. And you don't want your airport to be right here, right? No. And this is actually where Stapleton sort of was. <laughs> and so it is a good thing that we all have to drive farther to the east, to the Kansas International, as I affectionately call it. <laughs> Um, to get out of, of the rotor zone. Yeah. Uh, we did capture one of those in the medicine bows as well, and we documented it, it with the cloud radar, and we were able to quantify that turbulence in that jump. So here's another case of flying over the medicine bows. The aircraft is here at a relatively safe altitude. The waves are breaking. And I can tell you because we also did numerical simulations and, and, and we, I can, we were able to reconstruct fully what, what happened. And so there is a wave breaking here. The flow is plunging here on the lee side, a respectable 78 miles per hour, and then recovering through a jump. And that is, now turbulence is expressed slightly differently, but it is a severe, it is a severe turbulence. Um, for you who know what the ADR, uh, EDR is, it was 0.70. Okay. Um, so, it can get extreme. And this is about one minute long. And it is a poor case where the gusts were official record of 140 miles per hour. Again, this is a coastal range, mount, uh, coastal range, so from the mountains all the, to the sea. And there was a low over the Genoa, Bay of Genoa, and the anti-cyclone, high pressure area um, in Central Europe, which created a tremendous pressure gradient and pushed the air over that coastal mountain range. The coastal mountain range is, is fairly low. Um, and uh, but nevertheless, the, the, this actually has nice, we lost our sound for some reason. It's, it's fairly low coastal mountain range, it's only about one kilometer. Nevertheless, this flow, the, the Bora can be extremely, extremely severe. This persisted for two days, <laughs> and the average wind uh, speed was 60 miles per hour. This is what means being dedicated to measurements. Uh, <laughs> actually, the human, no matter how heavy and strong, cannot sustain when such does, gets blown away. So, uh, here, you are not looking at the coastal range. You are looking at the islands downwind. And you will notice that there is no vegetation. There is no soil. Um, they have been all swept away, years and years being beaten by boars. Uh, also, you don't want to find yourself down in the, the sea fog, because if you don't die from other reasons, you might actually suffocate. 
um, because um, this, uh, there is uh, lots of sea spray and it's very, very hard to re breathe. So no sailing under Bora conditions, especially extreme ones. Um, damage was significant. All ferry traffic in the Adriatic was, was halted and the economic damage was tremendous um, there. Boulder is no stranger to strong winds, extreme winds. And uh, here at the Mesa Lab in Tower A, uh, we have had an anemometer for, for a very long time um, at the mast. And um, this is the trace from January 1982. This case is uh, one of the most, uh, one of the costliest wind, wind storms here in Boulder. Uh, the, the economic damage from this windstorm uh, was $20 million and 40% of the structures in Boulder have been damaged. And uh, I guess builders have improved. <laughs> they're, they're, uh, they, they stick to better codes uh, since then. Uh, the two gusts here in this, uh, it was a five and a half hour event. Time is going from bottom to top. Um, and this is continuing. So the, where this stops, this one starts. Um, and you can see the gusts of the Bora. I've indicated with the red lines indicate 100, 120, 140 miles per hour. And there are two uh, gusts here of 137 miles per hour. And numerous ones above 120 miles per hour. And it is those gusts actually that, that do the damage uh, to, to the structures. Climatology of windstorms in Boulder. You all live in this town. You've lived here for a while. It, it is not an unknown to you that they peak actually in the cold part of the year. Um, January is when there is most of them. 30% of the days have something what is labeled, can be labeled as a, as a windstorm. Are they ubiquitous? Is this, this phenomenon ubiquitous or is this only a few locations I picked up for you to scare you? If you look at the distribution of the global mean wind speed at 80 meters, um, you can start making out some of the mountain ranges, the one I talked about, Colorado Rockies, Sierra Nevada, the Alps and the Dinaric Alps, the New Zealand, the Andes. They're clearly other windy places. So is Greenland, and for that matter, Antarctica as well. There are other areas that are not windy, clear, and here there's a blue area, which means low average wind speed. And in order to understand why is that, you look at the global distribution of the winds, and the blue area is the area of intertropical convergence zone, where the surface winds, which are marked here in red, actually meet. So there is a northeasterly trade winds in the northern hemisphere, and the counterpart in the southern hemisphere, they meet, and all the uh, wind is vertical and goes up and creates tremendous cumulus clouds, lots of precipitation, et cetera. But in mid latitudes and in high latitudes, the winds come from the west and they, they are perpendicular, whether it's sometimes from the west, sometimes from the east, because the weather systems determine what direction. And when the winds are perpendicular to the mountain ranges, this is when we can expect uh, the phenomena that I talked to you about. So if you look, if we look at the Earth topographic map, here it shows where the orography, significant orography on the Earth is. And the, our Rocky Mountains actually is the whole Cordillera on the Northern American continent, continuing down south. The Greenland, both the Greenland and Antarctica are very tall <laughs> because of the layer of ice on top of the solid rock there. And they are beautiful places uh, to study uh, um, phenomena, orographic phenomena. So is Iceland up here. So those of you who visited Iceland or who are planning to visit Iceland or have been there, um, you, you be, be prepared. It gets, it gets windy there. So to show you that actually the phenomena are quite ubiquitous, I've chosen a spot down here, which is called the Elephant Island. It's the continuation of the Antarctic Peninsula. And this photo comes from a recent, our NSF NCAR Gulfstream 5 mission over the Southern Ocean. The wind is blowing out the screen. Uh, you are looking in south, southwest toward the Elephant Island and the Elephant Island is like a ridge, it's elongated, and it's creating beautiful wave clouds and the rotor clouds underneath. This was taken uh, from the, during the mission photo, um, looking at the window of the Gulf Stream 5. 
Should you be afraid of flying after all in this talk? <laughs> Are you afraid of flying? <laughs> well, you should not be. Uh, unless you are a general aviation pilot, uh, in which case you already know quite a bit about this and then you can always learn more. And my advice is to be careful, uh, don't show hubris because atmosphere might surprise you no matter how well you know and how good a pilot you are. Be careful. Sailor, glider pilots, I know you are there devilish, but you are well trained. So, if you are like me, who fly commercial airliners most of the time, don't be afraid. And there are a number of reasons why not to be afraid. The bigger the aircraft, the less of an impact on the aircraft structure uh, from that turbulence. All pilots uh, have meteorological training and are well trained to avoid, avoid the areas of, of turbulence, uh, whether it's mountain generated or it's cloud generated turbulence. And also, the Federal Avi Aviation Administration has invested significant funding over the years in research uh, to make our flying safer, to make the skies safer. And quite a bit of that research has been done here at ANCAR in the Research Applications Laboratory, where over, in the, over the recent decades they've been working on quantifying the turbulence, um, getting the information out of the models, numerical weather prediction models, and getting the quantitative information on turbulence and translating this into the charts uh, for, the, for the pilots. So here do you see, this is called GTG, graphical turbulence. Um, I don't know what the other G stands for. Uh, <laughs> and I plotted the chart uh, last evening uh, for a heavy aircraft. You can choose the size of the aircraft here um, and whether you want a mountain wave turbulence or what your cloud turbulence or a mixture of the two uh, for a given forecast time. Um, I've got the chart which shows where the regions of turbulence are and most of that turbulence, if you look at down at the chart, is labeled as um, low turbulence, greenish, maybe some, some yellows, um, um, which it's, it's not a problem. If pilots detect uh, see areas of stronger turbulence, they of course work on rerouting, um, flying around that to avoid, avoid the worst. Also, they fly at approximately 30,000 feet, and which gives them quite a bit of altitude to work with in between the flight level and the ground. So, feel safe, but be curious. Thank you.